Hi again, everyone. Gary Digital Williams here on Boxing Law and About Weight Podcast Network. And the Boxing Law and About Weight Podcast Network, as always, can be heard on Spreaker.com, iHeartRadio.com, Stitcher, on TuneIn, on Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, also on Spotify. And if you call on your Alexa and say, hey, Alexa, play Boxing Along the Beltway, the podcast will come up as well. So that's something we just learned about a few weeks ago, actually, uh, actually a week ago. We just learned about the fact that Alexa has boxing along the Beltway. So you can definitely hear boxing on the Beltway anywhere you go here on the, on the podcast network. And this week, we do have a couple of results that came in this week. A couple of Beltway boxers were in action. And we also have a tribute to a, a boxer who, a champion boxer, who truly had a very unique career. And my association with him transcends a couple of eras, which is rare. And truth be told, as I look back on his career and my following his career, I originally never thought that he would be a world champion. And that's going to be our focus for this week. The Boxing on Beltway Podcast Network brought to you as always by real-time pain relief from boxers to ballerinas. For shoulder pain and muscle strain, everything in between, Boxing Along the Beltway recommends real-time pain relief, the natural, plant-based, safe, fast, and effective ointment. You go to freepainoffer.com, buy $10 worth of real-time pain relief. You get a free $10 tube of real-time pain relief, the official pain relief of the 2020 Daytona 500. Rub it on. The pain is gone in real time. And by DebraSpears.com. Her website, of course, has great weight loss tips. It has great jewelry. It also has great training methods as well. So go to Debra, D-E-B-R-A Spears.com. Well, before we get to our main tribute this week, a couple of the results we had this this, this past week, uh, and actually this past Saturday as well. Uh, first of all, just on Wednesday, uh, July the 15th, um, actually, it was on Tuesday, July 14th. Excuse me, July, Tuesday, July 14th. Uh, Frederick Maryland middleweight Ryan the Lion Burrs. He used to be known as Jonathan the Lion King Burns, but he's now going by Ryan the Lion Burrs. He lost a four-round unanimous decision to the debuting Javier Martinez of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was Tuesday at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, Burns lost by shutout to the 2020 middleweight United States Olympic Trials champion. This is a guy who had gone through there and did extremely well in the uh, Olympic trials. One of the people he beat was a guy that once beat him uh, early on in the amateurs. That's Troy Isley out of uh, Alexandria, Virginia. But Javier Martinez decided not to wait until 2021. He turned pro. He made a successful uh, transition to the pro ranks. Won by shutout on all three of the cards, uh, 40-36. And uh, so Javier Martinez 1-0 and Burns, uh, Burns, it's just a Ryan Burns, uh, now has his record evened at two and two. Meanwhile, on Saturday, July the 11th, uh, Baltimore, Maryland Super Middleweight, the undefeated Lorenzo Chuck Simpson, he registered a first round knockout, registered a first round knockout win over Alexandro Careca Duarte of New York by way of Brazil. This took place this past Saturday, July 11th, we said, at the Mississippi Coast Convention Center in Biloxi, Mississippi. Now, according to reports, Simpson used a vicious left to the body to stop his opponent at 1 minute and 20 seconds. Simpson remains undefeated. He's 8-0-5 KO, while Duarte falls to 16-10-1 with 13 KOs. Now, the bouts on this card were televised by CBS Sports Network, and the undercard, I heard, was on the Fight app, Fight TV app. And the announcing team had a sort of beltway, like it had a beltway flavor. The color commentator was none other than the International Boxing Hall of Famer and the three-time world champion Mark Tushop Johnson. Of course, he's been on uh, television before. He was on Showtime uh, a few years ago. Uh, and then he, in fact, he was uh, there before Pauli Malignaggi got there. And he was the color commentator and the blow-by-blow guy, a good friend of mine by the name of Ronnie Duncan. He's a graduate of Morgan State University. He's been in news and sports pretty much all over the country, especially in Baltimore and in Cleveland. He's also a graduate of Morgan State University in Baltimore. And they were the commentary commentary team. Very good t- team. Uh, you can see them on TV. They were social distancing. Duncan was on one side. Johnson was on another table. It was really nice to see. It was good to hear. So it was great to hear the two of them together. They did a good job, I thought, covering this card. And uh, once again, Lorenzo Truck Simpson was on the undercard. He scored the first round knockout over Alexandro Sandro Careca Duarte of New York. And Simpson's now 8-0. Five KOs. 
Now, we, we've heard, and I'm not sure how this is going to happen, but we've heard that Yank Plana will be at the MGM Grand on the 21st, on, on, um, on the 21st of July, in about, about actually scheduled for the 16th, actually scheduled for as we record this tonight, but apparently it won't be, and so uh, he'll be coming up a little bit later on, the Sexy Albanian, and he'll be coming up on his card, and we'll hopefully have some details about that in the future. Other than that, not a whole lot going on right now. I mean, nothing going on in the area. And when I say nothing going on in the area, I really mean that because not only is uh, boxing uh, not going on in this area, but other sports as well. In fact, the uh, the uh, D.C. Public Schools has canceled their fall season for athletics. The uh, actually D.C. State Athletic Association, they have canceled their um their sports for this year, the midi for the fall, I should say, for the Midi Athletic Conference that includes schools like Howard, um, who's Coppin State in volleyball, Morgan State in football, of course, uh, Maryland Shore in volleyball. Um, no, no sports for the fall for the Midi Athletic Conference. That's what includes track uh, cross country uh, running as well. So nothing's going on at all in this area because of COVID nineteen. So. Um, just sad to see, but we just have to live with it. I mean, when I say live with it, we just have to uh, do some things, and hopefully it'll get better by the time um, time the spring and winter comes around and we'll get ready to go uh, with basketball season, we hope. We'll see. So, meanwhile, let's go on to our tribute. Our tribute today is a guy, is a, is a great boxer, good friend, too, very nice guy. Uh, love working, uh, talking around him, working around him. Still involved in the boxing game because he has two sons involved and a brother who's involved as well. But um, he is one of the few boxers, if not the only boxer. I'm, I'm trying to really kind of figure it out, but I can't think of any other boxer that transcends all three major eras of my boxing career. He goes from the boxing spotlight era to the... Um, FightNews.com era into the Boxing Along the Beltway era. He was a major part, and I mean a major part, of all three of those eras. And he is actually, and I, I, I don't say this with any kind of uh, begrudging toward him. Uh, it's nothing personal, believe me. But when I first saw him as a boxer, I really did not think he would be a world champion. I really didn't. I, I really... I saw him being a very good boxer, a uh, good contender, but I didn't know he could. He had enough to get. I didn't think he had enough to really get over the hump, but he showed me, and quite frankly, on one glorious night, he showed the whole world that he did, and uh, it, it's, it really is a very, very amazing story, and uh, we're going to talk about, talk about the story today when we talk about The Rock, Hasim The Rock Rockman. Now, this Baltimore, Maryland native had a tremendous career. I mean, you think about his career, and you got to look back on his career. There wasn't a boxer in the heavyweight division that he did not face. I mean, he faced pretty much every major heavyweight boxer that was around in that in his uh, career from 1994 to 2014. I mean, he he fought them all. He really did. Not not too many people. He he did not fight. And that has to be commended. But I think when he first started, I didn't see it going that way. I really didn't. I just, I don't know why. I just, when I, I didn't think about him as being a world champion. Okay. First of all, he got a very late start. Now, Rockman's uh, pre-boxing history is really, really interesting and really kind of uh, tough in all honesty. He was at one time, Involved in the drug trade. He was an enforcer for a number of drug dealers. And he survived very many shootings. Uh, he nearly died in a car accident. That left him with the scars that you may see on his body, on his cheek and his ear. Uh, he survived the shooting that five bullets entered his body. He's kind of a reminiscent of another guy who likes to tell a similar story in the area. A boxer by the name of Robert Boo Boo Sawyer. He talks about how that, that night when he got, I think it was 12 bullets went into his body. I'm not sure. But uh, it was a number of them. I do know that. And it really changed his life. And he has turned his life over to God. He's become a preacher and a prophet. But uh, Rachman, uh 
took a shooting where he had five bullets entered his body. So he's been, he was through a lot before he even got into boxing. And he got into boxing very late. He got into boxing at the age of 20. He only had 10 amateur bouts, okay, before he made his pro debut. He made his pro debut on December 3rd, 1994, in Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, scored a first round knockout over Gregory Harrington. Now, the first time I saw Rockman was in his third pro bout. That was on July, I'm sorry, January 11th, 1995 in Martins West in Woodlawn, Maryland. He took on Dennis Kane and he knocked out Kane in the second round. Uh, he would fight between here and the belt and the outside the beltway. Uh, I saw him fight again at Martins West on June 6th, 1995. And he knocked out uh, Eric Valentine in the first round. I do remember that. Now the uh, Jacks, the uh, Kane fight and the Valentine fight were just a couple of fights that, he, that we showed on Boxing Spotlight. Uh, I also showed the uh, fight on July uh, 13th, 1995, when he fought Larry Davis at Martin's Crosswinds in Greenbelt, Maryland, scored a second round knockout there. So his career was off to not a great start. He was just he was, he was taking his time getting through, but he was very busy during that time period. Very busy. He had... Um, he had nine pro fights in 1995 and 11 in 1996. So he made up for lost time, so to speak. And as his career progressed, he was starting to fight a little better competition. Okay. Uh, one of his big wins was a 10-round unanimous decision, his first 10-round bout against Ross Purity, who was a heavyweight contender at that time. Uh, that was on March 26, 1996 in uh, Rochester, New York. And so he would he would go on from there. And get into the 10-rounders, although he dropped back to the 6th round. His next fight was on March 3rd, 1996, against Steve Edwards in Moline. Um, Moline, uh, I think it was Kentucky. I'm not sure where Moline is, to be honest with you. But uh, Steve Edwards, he knocked him out in the second round. And then on October 15th, 1996, we started getting a little look on what type of contender that... Um, Hasim Rockman would be. He would take on former world champion Trevor Burbick at Caesars in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and he would win a 10-round unanimous decision. Uh, he would come back to the Beltway uh, on uh, December 17, 1996, and score a second-round knockout over Herman Delgado. That was at the Pikesville Armory in, that, in uh, Pikesville, Maryland. In July of 1997, on July 15, 1997, he would take on Jeff Wooden in Rochester, New York, and score a ninth round TKO. And that was his first scheduled 12 round encounter. His second one was against another uh, champ. Another actually, that fight, actually, that bout was for the vacant USBA heavyweight title. So he won his first uh, regional title at that time. He defended that title against Obed Sullivan. Also, the IBF Intercontinental heavyweight title was on the line that night too. And a 12 round bout. Um, Rockman would defeat Obed Sullivan on November, 11, November 1st, 1997 in New York at the famed Apollo Theater. 12 round majority decision for Obed, for uh, um, Hasim Rockman. Then on December 4th, 1997, um, Rockman would take on Tui Toa, a veteran in Albany, New York, and score an easy first round knockout there. Then going into 1998, he would take on another uh, local boxer by the name of Melvin Foster, Top Gun Foster out of Southeast, and he would beat Foster, knocking out his second round, second, knocking him out in the second round in Moscow of all places. Question about that. Then on July 9th, 1998, uh, Rockman would take on Garing Lane, Garing Lane, and beat Garing Lane in the second round. And then his first really, really major test will come up on December 19th, 1998. And that was when he took on David Tua. Now, David Tua was truly a rising, rising uh, star in the heavyweight division. I remember covering him way back when he fought at um, at uh, Boardwalk Hall in Lang City. And it was on the Prentel Whitaker-Gary Jacobs fight, Jacobs card. And in that bout, that was really kind of a strange bout because... This was for the mandatory uh, contendership in the IBF. And Rockman was doing well, outboxing tour, 
uh, virtually every round. But in the ninth, at the end of the ninth round, two was staggered Hasim Rahman, devastating belt punch after the bell that dazed him. Tua pounced on him immediately in the, at the beginning of the next round. Referee jumped in when Rock was bobbing and weaving. And Tua would end up winning that bout by 10th round TKO. <clears throat> that was his first loss as a professional. And a lot of people thought it should have been a disqualification on Tua's part. But uh didn't happen. And, and the win went to uh, David Tua. And that was Rock very first loss as a pro. He would bounce back, though. He would uh, knock out uh, Michael Rush on March 12, 1999 in New York City. Uh, score a TKO in the fifth round. Knock out Arthur Weathers in uh, Miami, Florida on um, April 15, 1999 in the first round there. And then he would take on Oleg Moskayev. And it was one boxer that was truly an issue for Hasim Rahman. It was Oleg Moskayev. And you don't know why, but in... Um, November of 1999, November 6, 1999, Moskayev would knock out uh, Rachman in the eighth round in Atlantic City. And that was a real tough, tough loss for him at that point. Rachman was knocked on in the ropes in that, during that fight. Rachman was kind of winning the fight, but at one point, uh, he was knocked through the ropes onto the floor. He hit his head on the floor. And, and uh, that led to the loss. Um Rockman would later tell people that he thought Moscow would be an easy win because uh, Moscow was knocked out by the Olive McCall. And Rockman claimed that because of it, he didn't train for the fight, and that's why he lost that fight. Well, that happened, and actually would happen uh, against him a little bit later on in his career. Um, Rockman would bounce back. He would take on another local boxer, Marion Jack Hammer Wilson. Every time he kind of lost the bout, uh, Rock will come back to his roots, so to speak. He fighting the beltway, and uh, he would be successful. And this time against a guy who was truly one of the hardest people. In fact, nobody of any significant fact, and no no heavyweight at all knocked out this guy. He had one of the toughest, if not the toughest, chin, maybe in heavyweight history. I don't know. Definitely in the last thirty years or so. A man by the name of Marion Jackhammer Wilson. And uh, Rockman beat Wilson by 10 round uh, unanimous decision at Martin's West on March 3rd, March 1st, 2000. Then on May 20th, um, 2000, um, Rockman would knock out Corey Sanders. This is the Corey Sanders out of South Africa, the late Corey Sanders. Um, this is for the WBU, the World Boxing Union heavyweight title. Knocked, uh, Rockman would knock out Sanders in the seventh round. <clears throat> He would knock out uh, Frankie Swindell on April. I'm sorry, August 4th, 2000, in Las Vegas on the seventh round stoppage. And then he would take. He would shock the world. Now I got to talk a little bit about what happened prior to this. Uh, Rockman uh, would take on Lennox Lewis. And it was for the undisputed uh, WBC, IBF, and the IBO heavyweight championship. Now. A lot of stories around this. First of all, there was the brawl during a prep, during a um, television appearance on ESPN between Rockman and Lewis. That was that, and and that went into that was kind of a crazy thing that went on. And again, it's kind of surprised me as far as Rockman's concerned because Rockman, you know, was not really that type of person. It really wasn't. But Lewis, kind of like what Rockman did against Moskev, did not train. Lennox Lewis did not take Rockman seriously. In fact, during the the time leading up to this bout, Rock, I'm sorry, Lewis was was in a movie, Ocean's Eleven, with Vladimir Klitschko, and he never trained for this bout. And when the bout went to South Africa, he didn't. He went there late. I mean, Rockman got there, I think, almost a month ahead of time. And we talked about a few weeks ago that uh, Keith Holmes, when he went to France. Only went there like a week before the fight and was never adjusted to the uh, to the time frame and all. Rockman went to South Africa at least three weeks, if not a month ahead of time. And he adjusted to the culture. He adjusted to the time change. He was a part of everything that was going on there. Lewis got there maybe a week and a half before the fight. 
And when the fight took place on April 22nd, 2001 in Carnival City, Brockbun, South Africa, Hasim Rahman truly, truly shocked the world. And he knocked out Lennox Lewis in the fifth round to win the IBF. WBC and IBO world heavyweight title. In essence, he was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And it was that was an amazing moment. It really was an amazing moment to see the fight, number one. It was on Showtime. And I remember Jim Lampley saying that the there's a new heavyweight champion of, of the world, and he's an American. And that was amazing. We hadn't had a lot of American champions at that time. He was the first in quite some time. And... It was an amazing moment, and even after that fight, it was an amazing moment. Now, again, this was on in April, April 2001, and I got sent by Fight News to try to to cover Rockman's homecoming back to Baltimore, and it was an amazing thing. I'll never forget sitting next to the then mayor of Baltimore, who later became the governor of of Maryland by the name of Martin O'Malley. And he and I were sitting at BWI airport waiting for um, Rockman to come in. And we were going to celebrate his, his championship win right then and there. Well, <laughs> didn't happen because Rockman missed his connecting flight in New York. He was going to be late. So we ended up going to a place called the Hobo Shop, which was a clothing store in Baltimore. They had one in D.C. as well. And they were very much involved in, in boxing at that time. They had uh, put together, helped put together the Platinum Gloves Amateur Boxing Tournament at that time. And we ended up going to the Hobo Shop to see Rockman come in. And it was just tremendous to see him and congratulate him on his win and talk to him and interview him a little bit. It was amazing. Amazing, amazing to be a part of that. The very next day, they had a, a parade for Rockman in Baltimore. They had a better parade downtown Baltimore. And even that ended up being crazy. Because I didn't I didn't go to the to the uh to the parade, but I did watch it on television. And during the parade, during the parade, Rockman's car was sideswiped. During the parade. A, a person came in, crashed through the parade route, and sideswiped Rockman's car with Rockman's wife in it. And it was, it was, and Crystal was in there. And it was, it was just to hear about that was just amazing. It really was. And so Rockman was on top of the world. And I remember doing the platinum gloves a little bit later on that year, and at the Washington Convention Center, and I and I sat between. I was doing play by play for it, and on my left was Vincent Petway, on my right, Hasim Rahman. And these are the two boxers that have held world champions, the only two other boxers to ever held, hold world championships other than the legendary Joe Gans. So we're talking almost 100 years before another world champion would be in Baltimore. First was Vincent Petway, of course, and then Hasim Rahman. And just that history was amazing to me. Now, a lot of things went on between Rockman winning the title and him getting a rematch, him, him giving Lennox Lewis a rematch. First of all, he changed promoters. Now, that was really weird. He was with Steve Nelson, who had guided him all through his career. And um, suddenly he took, took the money and he went with Don King. Now, looking back on that, that may have been a mistake because... He had an opportunity to, to really get some good money through Nelson still, but Don King is Don King. And when Don King wants you, you know, a lot of people say, don't say no to him. And that Hasim Rotman did not say no to him at that time. And the rematch came against uh, Lennox Lewis on November 17th, 2001. And Lennox Lewis was more focused. He was more more involved with the bout. He trained hard for it. It was in Las Vegas and Lewis dominated the fight and won a fourth round knockout. So that was in for now of um, Rockman's uh, title uh, holding. But uh, again, it was a wild ride even without a 
boxing boxing bout in between. So on November 17th, uh, Rockman would lose the world title back to Lennox Lewis. Then on June 1st, 2002, and I was at this bout at Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, Lewis would take on another legendary boxer by the name of Evander Holyfield. And that bout was at Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City. And I actually attended this bout. I was live in, in, uh, in the bout. It was eliminated for the WBA Heavyweight Championship title. And Holyfield would stop Rockman in the eighth round by a technical decision. Because Rockman had a bump on top of his head that was amazingly huge. In fact, you've heard the famous, I've heard me, you heard me reference the famous quote that uh, Rockman gave. He said, I had a head on top of my head. And it was caused by, by uh, headbutts from Holyfield. Holyfield was not the cleanest boxer in the world. And he, it was headbutts that uh, caused a massive swelling and a severe hematoma on Rockman's forehead. Again, he said he had a had a head on top of his head, but he would lose that fight. Then on March 29, 2003, Rockman would get back into the ring against David Tua for a second time. This was at the Philadelphia Spectrum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, Tua and Rockman would battle to a a uh, twelve round split decision. It was an IBF heavyweight uh, heavyweight title eliminator. Now. Rock, one judge scored it for Rockman, one judge scored it for Tua, and another judge had the third judge had, had the score even. Now, Tua was knocked down that about a split second after the bell rang. It wasn't ruled an official knockdown. And at that point, Rockman was also in the heavyweight, heaviest weight of his career. At that time, he came in at 259 pounds, which is the heaviest he had ever been. But Rockman was elevated to the number one contender's position by the WBC, even though it's an IBF. Heavyweight championship title eliminator, he would have a, he would uh, be number one by the WBC because of this bout. On December 13, 2003, uh, Rockman would lose a 12 round unanimous decision to John Ruiz, who ended up being the first Latino to be a heavyweight champion. He would lose by a 12 round unanimous decision. That was a WBA, that was for the interim WBA World Heavyweight Championship, as a matter of fact. And once again, after losses, Rockman would go back to his roots. And on March 11, 2004, and I was here for that one as well, Rockman would take on former IBF Cruiserweight Champion Alfred Ice Cole. And that bout was at Michaels 8th Avenue and Grand Bernie, Maryland. I remember this bout was regionally televised. Larry Michael uh, and John Saracino did the play-by-play. John Simon, I think, was involved. But also, the host, and I got to uh, spend some time with him on camera, was a very good friend of mine for many years. He had been a sportscaster here in the Washington area, and he and I went actually went to school together at Howard University, and that was George Johnson. And he would be the host for this track because about was shown on Home Team Sports at that time, known as Home Team, home team Sports, now uh, NBC Sports Washington. And Rockman won a 10-round unanimous decision in that bout. All three judges in that card, uh, about uh, John Gradowski, Bill Holmes, and Don Risher, all scored about 96 to 94. And I believe that was the last time that Rockman would, would compete in the Beltway. And he also took some time. I know he did. I'm sorry. Take it back. He, um, on, actually, no, I take it back. It was not the first time, last time. He would fight again at the, at Michael Zick Avenue on June 17, 2004. He would knock out Rob Calloway in the second round in that bout. He would fight and, uh, <clears throat> he would fight on fight Terrence Lewis on July 28, 2004 in Rochester, New York. Second round knockout there. Win a uh, fourth round stoppage over Cali Meehan and the WBC IBF heavyweight title eliminator in Mad Square Garden on November 13, 2004. Then on uh, August 13, 2005, Rockman would defeat Monty Barrett in a 12 round M decision. That was for the interim WBC heavyweight championship, and that would be Rockman's second world title. And I got a chance to work with Monty Barrett a couple years ago in a card in Washington, D.C. We did uh, the broadcast for that. Nice guy, very nice guy. But uh, he would, uh, Rockman, win his second world title and win the uh, WBC heavyweight championship, interim WBAC heavyweight championship. It was elevated to the full WBC title. And Rockman would defend that title on March 18, 2006, 
against former world champion James Lights Out Tony. It was at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, and uh, the fight would end in a 12-round majority draw. That was on uh, March 18, 2006. Then on 8, August 12, 2006, Rob would defend his title against Oleg Moskev, the guy who beat him a few years ago. And Moskev beat him again, this time by 12th round TKO. It was a mandatory defense of Rotman's title. And Rotman would lose the title back to, Ma- to Moskev at the Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas. <clears throat> and that would be it for Rotman for a little while until June of 2007. He'd knock, he, uh, win a 10 round unanimous decision over Taurus Knight. Sykes, uh, he'd win a second round knockout over Dickie Ryan in, in September 2007. He'd win a uh, first round knockout of Sarone Fox in October of 2007, but he would never really reach the level of being a world champion again. Um, and on July 16, 2008, Rotman would fight James Tony for a second time, and he would Originally lose a bout by third round TKO. However, the bout was in California. And in that bout, um, Tony, the, the, they changed it to a third round no contest. Rotman was stopped by an accidental headbutt. Tony was originally awarded TKO victory. The referee declared that Rotman had been quit between the rounds. But the, a week later, the route, the victory was overturned and changed to no contest. Uh Tony was ahead on the cards, 29-28 on two of the judges' cards. Rotman was ahead 20 and 28 on one of the other cards. On the other cards, I should say. So uh, that was a no contest there. And then on um, December 13, 2008 in Mannheim, Germany, uh, Rotman would face Vladimir Klitschko for the um, Unified World Championship. And Rotman would lose by seventh round TKO. Rotman would take two years off and come back in March of 2010, score a first-round knockout over um, Clinton Boldridge in Kansas City, Missouri. First-round knockout there. He would knock out Shannon Miller in the fourth round in June of 2010 in Niagara Falls. He would come back to the Scope Arena in the, in Norfolk, Virginia, score a uh, six-round knockout over Damon Reed on August 14, 2010. He would uh, knock out Marcus McGee in Panama City in October of 2010. And then finally in September of 2012, he would take on Alexander Povetkin for the WBA Heavyweight Championship. And he would lose a um, by a second round knockout in that bout. Then he'd take two more years off. And then finally in 2014, Rotman would sign up for a Super 8 tournament in Auckland, New Zealand. But despite holding the tag as a tournament favorite, uh, Rotman was outpointed by Anthony Nansen in the quarterfinal on June 4th, 2014. And that would conclude Hasim Rotman's career. Rotman would end his career with a record of 50 wins, 9 losses, 2 draws, with 41 wins by knockout. So, Again, he had a very sterling career. You know, two world titles, undisputed heavyweight championship, one of the biggest upsets in boxing history. Um, I think he's borderline Hall of Fame because if you look at his as his at his uh, his record, he fought everybody. Like I said, he fought Vladimir Klitschko, James Tony, David Tua, Oleg Maskev, Corey Sanders, uh, Vander Holyfield. Uh, Lennox Lewis, of course. I mean, he fought all the major names of his era. And he did win two world championships. And he did have one of the, the, the biggest upsets in boxing history. I think you gotta got to at least give him an opportunity to look at his career as a Hall of Famer. I mean, and he's been great for the sport. I mean, he continues on in the sport. He's training um, heavyweight by the name of Michael the Body Bounty Hunter. And, of course, he has his two uh, sons, uh, Hasim Rahman Jr., gold-blooded Rahman, and Sharif C3 Rahman, who are fighting very well in the Beltway. Both are undefeated right now. But I think he's borderline at least for Hall of Fame. I think you got to really look at it. I mean, he, he finished his career in 2014, so 
he's getting to a point now he's at least eligible to be taken a look at for Hall of Fame status. And again, he fought everybody. And he beat some of them. He didn't beat them all. You know, but he beat Corey Sanders. You know, he had a tough loss against Savannah Holyfield. I think the two losses to Moscow have may hurt him. And the loss and the draw from Tua, who neither one of them got to be world champions. No, I'd say that Moscow did get to be a world champion. But Tua never got to be a world champion. So, when you look at that, that may hurt him a little bit. But you look at body of work, and you look at his uh, his uh, his itinerary, his, I should say his, uh, not itinerary, that's a bad word. To look at his uh, his record, he fought the greats of his era, all of them, just about all of them. I don't think he was anyone he did not face. And I think that needs to give him serious consideration for Hall of Fame status. I hope he gets it. Really do. I know he's been up there to cast his uh up in Canisto to cast his uh his fist there. So maybe that, that means something I don't know. But I think he, he needs to be least considered to be a Hall of Famer. And he'd be the second Hall of Famer for this area, uh, since Mark Tushar Johnson. And really only the third other than the 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 the, the, the boxes way before us who have made it. But you know, in the modern era, uh, he'd be only the third, at least in my era, I should say, he'd be only the third behind Sugar Ray Leonard and Mark Tushop Johnson. And uh, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Again, this is a guy that I really did not think would be anywhere near in this position. I thought he'd be a good fighter, good contention, but I really didn't think he would go all the way to do to accomplish what he has done. I'm so glad I was wrong. <laughs> I am so glad that I was wrong because he has had a great career. Rob has been a very nice person. We've gotten along very well and truly one of the greats to ever come out of the beltway. No question about that. So that's my tribute to our scene, the rock rock man, a tremendous, tremendous boxer. The box on the podcast network brought to you by real time pain relief. Once again, you go to free pain offer.com buy $10 worth of real time pain relief. You get a free $10 to of real time pain relief, the official pain relief, of the 2020 Daytona 500. Rub it on. The pain is gone in real time. And by DebraSpears.com. Great weight loss tips, great training methods, and great jewelry at Debra, D-E-B-R-A Spears.com. I'm Gary Digital William. Thank you as always for joining us here on Box on the Boat, a podcast network. We look back to seeing you once again with another podcast with some history on the Boat, boxing scene. Until then, thanks for joining us. Always remember to keep supporting the best boxing in the world, the boxing on the Beltway. Thanks for listening. Take care. Oh, beautiful right hand by Dale Cole.